Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I had to move my title around a little bit so that it would all fit on one line, um, but we got there. Um, so my opening admission, which I like to make in symplectic seminars, is that I'm not a symplectic geometer, really. I'm an algebraic geometer who, has, uh, who is very grateful for a warm welcome uh, to your field. Um, and so what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna talk about, so, I mean, the main, the main sort of problems are really grounded in symplectic geometry. So the main problems are really symplectic in nature, they're symplectic embedding problems. But a lot of the methods that are, I'll use to study them are algebraic in, in nature. Main methods are sort of algebraic stuff in the in the world of algebraic geometry, and I'll try I'll, I'll try and sort of emphasize the interplay or try and make it clear when um, where there are kind of clear um, analogies across across those fields. Um, and a, a kind of happy byproduct of this um, is that consequences kind of go in both directions. And because I think you'll all prefer the applications in symplectic geometry, I'm going to mostly stay there. Um, but you know, a lot of what I care about is interfacing between these two worlds, these these two geometries. So let me set a bit of context. Um, let x omega x prime omega prime be symplectic manifolds. And I'll always assume at the same dimension. All right. Well, first off, I'll often omit the form, but I'll write x uh, curly arrow with an s on top, uh, x prime, if there exists a symplectic embedding, not specifying the embedding. from x to x prime, by which I mean, i.e. there is a smooth embedding iota um, from x to x prime, such that the natural interplay you would expect between symplectic forms um, is respected. Okay, and so there are kind of fundamentally two facets to any symplectic embedding problem, any question about symplectic embeddings. First is, uh, is constructive. So this is actually constructing building, assembling, showing the existence of embeddings between particular spaces. And I'll just put a little bookmark here in, in kind of the main, uh, main stuff I'll talk about today. The constructive, st the constructive steps are kind of mostly taken by a guy called Kimmerer's Cave, um, who's an algebraic geometer at Pittsburgh. Um, but uh, we had to extend some of his stuff. Um, so really where I'm going to focus mostly is more on the obstructive side. It's constructive building particular embeddings or showing their existence. The obstructive side showing that certain embeddings cannot exist, usually by means of um, certain invariants. And that's really going to be the focus where we live today. Um, and I should have said uh, at the start that all original work here is joined uh, with Julian Chides. Okay, and so um, let, let's kind of focus. Let's drill in a little bit on this on this second facet. So for obstructions. These are usually um, usually invariants that are 
appropriately monotone. <laughs> under symplectic embeddings. But usually I think in this talk, it's gonna entirely be um, all my, all my uh, invariants will increase um, just strictly, strictly real numbers and they will be related by just inequality uh, when symplectic embeddings exist. Okay, so some examples. Let's just, I'm just gonna really quickly go through these as I suspect they're familiar to, um, to most of the audience. Possibly the most basic invariant you could look for um, is volume. If you embed something in something else, the volume in the larger thing better be bigger. Um, Gromov width, which I'll also just set notation, or we always call that C sub G. The Gromov width, so essentially the symplectic radius of the, uh, well, the supremum over the radii of balls embedding into your space. Um, and again, if you can fit a ball in X and X embeds in X prime, well, you better be able to fit that ball into X prime. And then a more, maybe a sort of uh, richer, in some ways, class of obstructions, the ECH capacities um, defined by hot chains. This is a sequence of invariants that ought to know by CK ECH um, of X omega, uh, which satisfy the property that I've written before. Satisfying. CK ECH X omega is bounded above by CK ECH of omega prime if X embeds symplectically into X prime. So everything I've, I've just described uh, is kind of really squarely in the world of symplectic and contact geometry. Um, let's start building a bit of a bridge to algebraic geometry. There are other invariants from algebraic geometry that also provide good embedding obstructions. Any questions or comments so far? Great, great. So let me let me tell you quickly. Um, I nearly admitted this, but I really want to. I, I think this is just really helpful, like philosophy framing. Maybe this is a way. Maybe this is a, uh, a phenomenon that uh, some of you are familiar with. But I, I want to say it in a certain way, which is going to, I think, capture much of the rationale behind what the rest of the talk is going to do. So let's give a nice example of a connection to algebraic geometry. And this is from work of McDuff Kolterovich and also features heavily in the work of Garan. <clears throat> so consider a polarized surface. And what I mean by this is I mean it's a pair YA, where Y is some, let's say, rational um, projective algebraic surface. So think about something like um, something like P2, CP2, or CP2 blown up at a number of points, um, something like that, a Hertzberg surface. And A is an ample divisor. So if you like, it's a formal linear combination of dimension one sub-varieties where I'm allowing them to have real coefficients. Think of it as a homology class, if you like. Uh, what does rational mean over there? Yeah, rational means that it's, it's birational to P2. So really, you should think of that. I'm going to give you the bad definition. The bad, the bad definition is that it's, it's isomorphic to either P2 blown up at a number at some number of points or Hertzberg surface blown up at some number of points. Um, another way you can think of it is it includes it includes a torus, um, an algebraic torus. 
for the question. Okay, so let's pick a bunch of points on our surface, and then let's draw holes around these. So these are four holes. Let's say the balls have radius ri, symplectic radius ri. Okay. So if I do a few things, if I excise these open balls, just cut them out of my space, collapse the boundary, to collapse the S3s onto S2, part of the Hopf map. The result of this is that what I've done is I've essentially reduced points, I've exchanged points for spheres. So I've just, this is just an expression like a topological presentation of the blow up of my surface Y at my red points. What I get is I just, Get a topological picture for what I want to know uh, as the blow up at, let's say, endpoints of my surface Y. Okay, but we also have this area data, right? We also have these RI. Uh, was your original surface closed? Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, really, really. I usually do this example with P2. So if you think P2, that's totally fine. So this is possible with balls of radius Ri. If and only if there exists a symplectic form uh, I mean, depending where you want to think of divisors living, but I'm just going to say it like this, there exists a symplectic form, which is Poincaré dual to the divisor uh, H minus some Ri Ei on this block, where what I mean by this is H is the pullback of a hyperplane class in P2. Um, I guess I should be on P2 at this point. So let me actually say, Pi star A, pi is the blob. A is my divisor. I pull my ample divisor back. I've now got a divisor on the blob. And I'm just subtracting uh, Ri copies of each of the exceptional divisors, Ei, living above those red points. <laughs> so this is possible. In other words, I can find these balls and cut them out. Um, if and only if there is a symplectic form of this type. Well, one way to guarantee that is if um, is if the class is ample. In other words, some multiple of it has enough sections to embed um, my surface into a projective space. Okay, so what we've ended up with, if you want to phrase it a slightly different way, is I can symplectically embed a disjoint union of radius Ri into my surface Y equipped with the symplectic form Poincaré dual to my divisor A if this divisor is ample. Not if and only if, but in particular when. So this left-hand side is sort of a symplectic embedding problem. It's something living in the world of symplectic embeddings. This right-hand side lives entirely in the world of what I would call algebraic positivity. It's concerned with sort of positivity properties, sec, positivity properties of divisors of things purely living in algebraic geometry. Okay. And this is sort of exactly the interplay that I want to exploit, want to make use of throughout the talk. 
We're always going to have some symplectic embedding problem. And then we're going to have, you know, the, the best the best version of this would be if I had an if and only if there. That's what we're going to get actually in the result hopefully I'm going to present. Um, but this is the sort of flavor of interplay that I want to get at. Um, could you repeat what that collapse looks like? Oops. Yeah, I'm just using I'm just using the the Hopf vibration, like the Hopf map, to just collapse each of those like boundary S3s onto S2s. Okay, cool. And then S2 is P1 and yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. I, I have one mm -hmm. clarifying question. So the ampleness of A is just a necessary condition to even have a symplectic form representing this point. It's a sufficient condition to have one. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of those two. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in general, like you know, you can consider the cone of sort of classes. Again, everything's Poincare dual, but it's fine. Like the cone of classes. Containing a symplectic form, or you can, and you can also have a cone of ample divisors, and the kind of ample divisor cone is smaller in general than the symplectic cone. Cool. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about. Let me tell you a little bit about the sort of some of the main players, the main invariants that I'm going to work with. Um, these were introduced um, by a paper of mine in 2019, and then Julian and I did a bunch of work on these, and they've appeared in a few other places since. These algebraic capacities, these are sort of, if you're familiar with ECH capacities, these are the algebraic geometry analogs to ECH capacities. I'll make it kind of precise what's going on there. Let's just jump straight in and define it and then chat about that definition. So again, this is basically always my, my context. Why A is a polarized surface. Again, I should probably say it's rational, but that's the only context we're gonna deal with. And again, the sort of, again, really just to ground you, if you're not comfortable thinking about polarized surfaces, think of this as P2 equipped with hyperplane class or something like that. That's a perfectly good and rich model to think about. We'll define a very similar sort of definition to ECH capacities. I'm going to write all the symbols and I'll hopefully give a much more concrete notion of what it means. So this is an optimization problem. Uh, the CKR numbers are essentially the solutions or the areas of solutions to some isoparametric problem. This NE down here, this is the cone of effective divisors or because we're on a surface, effective curves living on a surface. So these are curve classes. A dot D is the intersection parent. So if you prefer, you could think of this as integrating the symplectic form for A over the curve D. Now this last condition, um, we're asking for some Euler characteristic to be kind of sufficiently large. Um, what I mean here is, well, each you know, algebraic geometry, each divisor has an associated uh, line bundle or something like a line bundle. Um, this is the Euler characteristic of that line bundle. And the way you should kind of think about it is this is a sort of moduli or index condition. So in a lot of cases, uh, when your divisor is sort of positive enough, this chi of D is really just H naught of D. It's really just global sections of D. And global sections of D are telling you how big is the family that D moves in, right? It's telling you sort of how much can you move this curve within your space. And right, for symplectic geometers, right, this is exactly sort of what an index condition is telling you. So really, this has a very similar flavor to you know, many of the classic capacities, symplectic capacities defined um, by ECH or other flavors of contact homology. Um, and this is sort of, this is the idea for emulating this. This is the natural thing you would do if you're emulating this in algebraic geometry. Okay. And so I think I'm never really going to play with the Euler characteristic. It's in my in our situation. It's really it's really sort of translated 
heading to H dot is at least K plus one. And let me tell you kind of, you know, why, apart from sort of morally, it's a good thing to think about. Um, let me tell you the theorem, which is, this is a sandwich theorem of uh, one, a theorem of mine and uh, a theorem of minor Julian's uh, says the following. Again, in our normal context, YA is a polarized surface. Uh, this time I really need it to be rational. And if x omega is some star-shaped domain, symplectically embedding into my rational surface, then the ECH capacities of x omega are bounded above by the algebraic capacities of YA. When you say star-shaped domain, you mean inside of our four? Okay. Okay, so this is great because this is telling us that these algebraic capacities, which you know are computed by different methods doing different things, um, are embedding obstructions. And they're embedding obstructions into closed manifolds, into the sorts of things that maybe ECH or other technology isn't especially well suited to. Good question. Yeah. Is this can you use is this consequence like cyber good into Gromo? Uh, that's a key element in the proof, yeah. Yep, that's a key idea. Uh, one of the key ideas, yeah, again, since you ask, um, like this object here is kind of a, it's an interesting object to work with in kind of symplectic terms. We, uh, we actually can, we show that the, the minima are actually found, minima are achieved, and they're found in a smaller cone, the Neff cone, and things in the Neff cone have non-zero subequivalent invariant. So it's similar to like Macduff's. Yeah, it's, very, it's very similar flavor. That the ball packing is equivalent to the embedding of the ellipsoid. Yes. And this, so this is not true only for like concave toric domain. It's true for all star shape. Yes. That's right. That's right. But we have some more information here in the toric setting. So. <clears throat> Well, a particular kind of polarized rational surface is a toric surface. So if YA is a polarized toric surface, um, how should I say this? Oh, yeah. Then, and kind of, I guess by that, I should also mean this divisor A is a torus invariant divisor. Don't worry too much. Then, ECH capacities of the comp divisor complement. So I take my nice divisor, I cut it out. I'm left with some sort of open non-compact thing. These are equal to the algebraic capacities of YA. And let's make an aside here, which I'm gonna do in um, embarrassingly little detail because I suspect many folks here are already familiar with this idea. And if you're not, I don't think me belaboring it is going to be super helpful. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we have some, you know, some situation where these algebraic capacities are exactly ECH capacities on the nose. Um, and what situation is that? Is it an interesting one? And it is an interesting case. The sort of space that um, Y without the divisor A is, um, it's a toric domain. And by this, I mean it's of the form X omega, which is mu inverse omega, where mu from C2 to R2 is the moment map or a moment map. Um, for the standard torus action, two torus action on C2. Omega is some region R2, free image is a toric domain. And moreover, I guess I should say it's not just a toric domain, really, 
be it's a, it's a convex fluid domain. So Y minus A equipped with this symplectic form is an equal to, or I guess maybe let me say symplectomorphic to, uh, the interior of the, uh, of the convex toric domain x omega sur, where omega is the moment polygon of the pair y a, y omega a. So that's true even when y is not b2? Yes. Yeah. So again, maybe, maybe the most useful picture I can draw here um, is we draw something like this. Um, pretend I've drawn the same polygon on both sides. Um, on the left, I will draw a picture of x omega. So above any any point in the kind of open quadrant, I have two torus living above that point. When I go on to an axis, I have just a circle, and at the origin, I have just a point. I was drawing you a picture of y omega, the algebraic surface. The difference is here that, well, it's the same on the axes and in the interior of the polytope, but I also collapsed circles and points um, on the boundary of the polygon itself. And so also I will, yeah, another, another nice thing, which is something which <laughs> recurrently happens when you work with things in sort of the algebraic setting is that I also don't care about singularities here. This theorem is still true when Y is singular toric surface, so something like a toric overfold. Any questions or comments? I know it's a little, little fast treatment of toric domains, but cool. Great. Cool. Um, Oh, and maybe let me just wrap that by saying, so Maria, is that the algebraic capacities of y omega a omega, when I, well, by this I mean the polarized toric surface whose moment polygon is omega, is equal to the CH capacities of the convex toric domain x omega. So let's get to um, let's get to some new stuff. So it's not really a surprise in that previous case that we can say more in the toric setting because you know that's that's kind of all over the world of symplectic embeddings is that we can usually just say a lot more in the toric setting, and so it's also no surprise that we can say more in sort of the algebraic analogs of some of these problems. Um, but I don't know, something Julian and I wanted to do, many people have wanted to do and have made various approaches at is trying to deal with non-toric cases, like interesting non-toric cases. Um, and so something you might try and do, or something we were very motivated to try and do, was uh, instead of sort of looking for natural extensions in the symplectic world, was look for natural extensions in the algebraic world. And so the, one of the key things, or maybe the key device that lets you do so much more in the toric setting is our moment polytope omega. Right, that's kind of the key thing to calculation, the key thing, well, even to construction. It's just, it's just a great player in this whole game. So the, the extension in algebraic geometry to the, to the moment polytope is the new Nikunkov body, um, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define for you, tell you why it's a terrible definition, and, um, and, then, and then kind of show how it's going to fit into our story. Roughly. 
always a great start when uh, somebody begins a section with roughly. <laughs> <laughs> so roughly, given a triple, so it's a polarized surface, Y and A, like before, but with an additional piece of data. This additional piece of data is a valuation on the field of rational functions on Y. So you should think of this as this is an object which is prescribing a lattice point to a rational function, obeying some conditions, some sort of convexity conditions, but you know, so to think about it. Um, we produce an object I'll call delta y a nu nu Nikunkov body, which is a convex body, not necessarily a polygon or a polytope, living inside um, R, in our case, R2, where uh, if we're fixing working with surfaces. And I'll write the definition. Delta Y and U is uh, you take the convex hull of the union of rescaled valuations of sections or rational functions with prescribed regularity prescribed poles uh, prescribed by multiples of my divisor. So if you're thinking my hyperplane class, if A is a hyperplane class on P2, I'm asking for sort of rational functions on P2 um, that have, that are allowed, well, first one pole along a hyperplane, then a double pole along a hyperplane, then a triple pole, and then I'm rescaling each time to make sure that everything's not exploding. Well, okay, this definition is already kind of messy. Uh, in general, this thing is not, not closed, so we must take closure. Okay. Uh, let me maybe briefly say why this is, okay, let me say the theorem and then make a comment. A theorem, which is in a paper of Lazarsfeld and Rustata, um, but I think it was actually proven by Mataka, is the um, delta y a nu equals moment polytope when y a is toric and nu is also a toric valuation, just a certain type of valuation. So it really is recovering the moment polytope. The moment polytopes really are a subset of the sorts of things you obtain by this. Um, and maybe let me give a brief intuition of what's happening here. Um, this viewpoint might not be as familiar to you, but in algebraic geometry, lattice points inside the moment polytope are supposed to correspond to sections of the corresponding line model, or sort of functions with a given uh, regularity. Um, when you scale your polytope up, you are just getting sort of, you're adding uh, points, you're adding lattice points together, and that's corresponding to multiplication of sections. So rescaling is just saying, well, if the sections I'm given are, are kind of prescribed by dilates of my lattice polytope, I'm just rescaling. And so that in the, in the toric case, this whole union business is not really anything interesting. It's really just saying, I take a polytope, I scale it up, and then I scale it back down. So there's not much happening here. This, you know, moment polytopes are, are very nice. They're not the hardest things to compute. Um, and so it's a little bit illusory because the general case is far wilder and, and less pleasant. So in general, despite this very beautiful theorem, Unikunko bodies are very hard to compute. Um, and maybe just as a, you know, if, you, if you've ever met Sushadri constants before, so this is something like the analog of Gromov width, 
um, new Nikunkov bodies, if you were able to compute new Nikunkov bodies, you would be able to say very strong things about Sushardri constants. So if you know anything about the complexity of Sushardri constants, you know that new Nikunkov bodies hence have to be very complicated. Um, they also, in some sense, new Nikunkov bodies should know everything there is to know about the sort of positivity of the divisor A. So essentially any question about A should be answerable from that sort of lens from new Nikunkov bodies. So they are as complex as the entire field of positivity and algebraic geometry. Let me draw an example for you. And this is one that I computed by hand. And as you'll see, it's a fairly simple example, but it took me about six hours to compute. And maybe I don't know where I rate on the speed of uh, new Kunkov computers, but um, so if y is dp5, so this is the Telpezzo surface of degree five, p2 blown up in four general points. So this is the first non-toric Delpezzo surface. So you blow up in zero, one, two, or three points, general points, you're always toric, um, or you're not. And if I pick A to be the anti-canonical, then I get this lovely picture. Let me draw lattice points to make sure I don't. This guy right here is a new Nikunko body for YA, where the valuation is, I look at, well, okay. I fix a minus one curve E on my surface. I look at the order of vanishing of my section along E. And then pick a point Y, E, is a minus one curve instead, of, instead of Y. Little Y is just a random point um, inside E. And then my valuation is to pair the number order of vanishing along E, and then the order of vanishing at Y when I restrict my section to E. Okay. Order of vanishing is well defined for divisors, so I make this little chain to uh, make sure that I can define my order each time. And in fact, for a surface, almost uh, every every valuation appears like this. Okay, and so let me let me show you quickly like something something nice that you might expect from a new Nikunkov body, just to again kind of emphasize the connection with moment polytopes. If we find the area. Uh, of this of this polygon, well, I'm going to do it by counting triangles, um, and it's a sort of normalized area. So triangles have volume one. There's one triangle. There's two more, and then this one here is two triangles. So that's five triangles. Delpezzo of degree five should have volume five. Okay. Given a new Nikunkov body, we can define its weight sequence, uh, which is the same weight sequence or weight expansion as one defines in, uh, in the context of ECH, which I'm just going to do pictorially. My next example. So the first step of the process, I'm going to take the smallest uh, right triangle containing my polytope. So in this case, the kind of maximizing point is this one, which is one, two. So this is the right triangle with uh, side length three. These two.
regions, these two kind of extra regions, once you perform a sort of canonical affine translation or affine uh, transformation, sorry, they become uh, triangles, right triangles of side lengths one and two. You can kind of see that there's two lattice points along here and stuff like that. Um, we play sort of the opposite game now and ask for the largest right triangle contained in each of these triangles. In this case, both case, both cases here, it's a triangle of side length one. Repeat, cut out the remainder. And in both cases, I'm actually just left with triangles of side length one. So the weight sequence that I record is I record a three at the front for this first very special triangle. And then each time I was, each of these remaining four times I was cutting ball of size one or triangle of size one. And so I don't worry about the order and I just write weight sequence as three, one, one, one. Okay, uh, let's jump ahead a little bit. This sequence is very natural if you think about the anticanonical divisor on DB5. Right. So in the basis H, callback of hyperplane class from P2, and then exceptional divisors minus K of DP5 is 3H minus E1 minus E2 minus E3 minus E4. And there we have our three, one, 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 one. So if you kind of have an ECH hat on at this point, uh, you might hope that this polytope right here is gonna play a similar role to the moment polytope for DP5. Like DP5 doesn't have a moment polytope. Um, it's not a toric thing. But we hope that this new Nikunkov body plays a similar role in the theory. And that's exactly what happens. Okay. So I just need a, I need a tiny bit more of a uh, tiny bit more language, and then I'm ready to tell you the, the main theorem and some applications. Obstructions from Unikunkov bodies. Let's build a rational surface as a tower. Um, starting at P2. And then taking a bunch of blobs. Up to sort of trivial blobs, um, which I'll say something about in a sec, you can re represent any rational surface in this way, even the ones that aren't blobs of P2. Um, and let's assume, moreover, that we have uh, divisors, ample divisors, let's say, on each of these. Let's say we start with C times hyperplane class. Then here I have A1, which is pi one star of A0 minus A1 the exceptional divisor of my first blob. And I recursively just keep building until I have a n, which I want to be my a I started with, which is pi n star of a n minus one minus a n yeah. Okay, so I'm just representing my, my surface y a as sort of something I get from P2 by taking blobs and moving my divisors appropriately. And if you said so my, my earlier point, if you're happy with some of the AIs being zero, you can represent any rational surface in this way. So I'll define the weight sequence of YA just to be the numbers exactly as you expect. C 
A1 through AN. So as I've defined it, the canonical divide, the anti-canonical divisor on DP5 has weight sequence three and then four ones. Okay. The new theorem that Julie and I proved recently. Uh, comes in a few parts. Well, let me say the main bit. If YA polarized rational surface has a new Nikunkov body, delta, such that the weight sequence of YA agrees with the weight sequence of delta, then sort of everything that held in ECH lands continues to hold. then the algebraic capacities of my, my very non-toric thing YA equals the algebraic capacities of the toric surface whose moment polytope is delta. Uh, and moreover, um, this equals This equals by the theorem before the ECH capacities of the convex toric domain X delta. Okay. So the actual the actual theorem we, we prove is, is a little bit stronger than I stated. Uh, the theorem is actually essentially that algebraic capacities are independent of weight sequence or, in, or, or depend only on weight sequence, right? Which is a familiar claim to people who work with toric ECH. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say, uh, I'll say a brief verbal, well, I guess, yeah, I'll say a verbal word about the proof. So the proof of how this goes is that when you have um, a surface represented as a tower like this, um, you can, you kind of have a canonical basis for the Picard group for the place where divisors live, which is given by the pullbacks of each of these exceptional divisors and H. Um, and then the algebraic capacities become sort of numerical problems. The only thing you need to figure out is, well, those cones of curves could be different for different surfaces. How do they relate? How do you find optimizers? And there's some sort of clever, clever, clever games you can play um, that end up giving, giving you what you want. Okay. So this is, this is the obstructive side of the story. Um, Let's let me very briefly say something about the constructive side, uh, which I don't really want to dwell on, and then I'll tell you um, the one or two applications, which I can I'll state pretty concisely. Sorry, can I just ask? Of course. You said something about if you can embed a uh, star-shaped domain into this and uh -huh. get an uh, inequality. Yeah. Where do you use that it's a star-shaped domain? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Couldn't you do that for any simple like mantle? I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I will. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll get back to you. So the other place, you know, okay. So one of these angles is Unikunkov bodies, generalized moment polytopes. Moment polytopes are really helpful for us. So that was a natural thing. The other thing that kind of grabbed our attention is this work of Cave um, that uh, studies Gromov width of uh, projective varieties via Unikunkov bodies. Um, so let me, let me just briefly tell you that given a Unikunkov body YA, Oh. Delta YA, we get, um, we essentially get an embedding of the, well, the way I should really write it is we get an embedding of the, uh, the pre image of the interior of the polytope delta. So this often gets called a free domain. 
So this one is really just an algebraic torus C star squared um, with, you know, with some area form. into R Y A. Okay, so this is this is this is somewhat attractive now because if we can embed things into here, into this nice torque domain, then we also get them immediately in here. Um, there are a few things we have to be careful about. These free domains are not, not as, as nice when delta lives away from the coordinate axes. Um, so Julian and I strengthened this to really an embedding of the, we moved the dot to an embedding of the interior of the of a convex torque domain into Y omega A. And the construction is sort of a, again, I really, I'm not going to say any, any real words about it. The construction is a sort of weighted deformation to normal cone. Uh, which which Kevin constructs. The conclusion of all this, the important conclusion I want to take away is that if I have some compact thing, XK, let's say, embedding into X delta circ, then I get that XK also embeds into my rational circuits. And so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spell out all the steps, but this beautiful theorem of Dan Christopher Gardner says that ECH is a sharp embedding obstruction for embeddings of concave toric domains into convex ones, gives in this setting um, gives the theorem again with the previous assumptions of delta is a unicum cov body. YA with weight sequences matching up. Then the algebraic capacities of YA very nearly sharply obstruct embeddings of. concave toric domains into this non-toric rational surface Y omega A. The game here is we're building, we're building embeddings via our generalization of Cave's method, but we're also showing that those embeddings are the best because we also have great control of the obstructions um, from this CK out equals CK ECH calculation I did before. And the nearly, uh, the nearly here, again, I'll just say verbally, the nearly here is, well, you, instead of getting that X omega embeds into YA, you get X C omega embeds into A for any C less than one. So if you're interested in computing widths, like Gromov widths or other sorts of things, then you're good to go. The big takeaway is that um, embedding questions of this type, for non-toric YA get converted into um, toric questions via this new Nikunkov machinery. And the missing element, um, you know, Cave did, did some got some lower bound stuff on Gromov width, but he didn't have any obstructive control. Like he didn't have any good capacities. Uh, the main, one of the main things we did is we built this connection between algebraic capacities, embedding obstructions, uh, and toric embedding obstructions, ECH capacities. So we can do both lower and upper bound. And so what I'll just, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop right after this, but let me just, you know, the, thing, the one gap I don't want to leave is I've said all this stuff about when Unicumcov bodies exist with the right weight sequence, but I also told you they're really hard to compute. Um, so let me just tell you two instances where this works.
full double pad subsurfaces, which you kind of hope. And also what you should expect, well, any blow up of P2 where the points you blow up are in very general position, um, And let me just say some, some inequalities hold for the weight sequence. Essentially what all these inequalities say is that the AIs have to be a good amount smaller than C in the head. So if you're kind of sufficiently close to, um, to C0000, zero, 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 um, you're, you're, you're good. Um, but it work, this works for any N. Um, and so some, some questions we've been able to resolve are, well, first of all, you can compute any, you, know, you can at least make steps towards computing um, widths, the sort of Gromov width calculations or uh, widths where you're interested in, well, what's the biggest multiple of a concave toric domain that I can embed into, into my non-toric rational surface. So in particular, this lets us get access to sort of staircase problems. Uh, we were able to show that in two cases for a bunch of forms on the double pencil of degree one of degree three. Um, there are no infinite staircases. These are kind of non-toric things which we're able by our technology to reduce to toric things. Um, and we get back some interplay with uh, Sichardry constants. And I think there's a lot of promise in that area too. So thanks for your attention. Uh, thanks for listening. Happy to talk more. Question. Um, do you have hope of being able to do something similar about the concave toric domains on the left side of the brain? Oh, you Generalizing mean? concave toric domains to something where you could get sharp embedding structure. Yeah, I've thought about this a little bit, not with much success. Um, the analog, um, the, the best analog that I and playing this, and this is really you know, me really out on a limb here, mm -hmm. is um, so, okay, the concave bit is kind of like the negative bit of the weight sequence, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the divisor in my, you know, in, let's say for the anti-canonical, for anti-canonical DP5, it's like the divisor E1 plus E2 plus E3 plus E4. I would hope, like a Unikunkov theory exists for those things, right? but those are just plain old pseudo-effective devices, you know, really bad positivity properties. Um, but those are, the, those are the things which I think in algebraic geometry should correspond to concave toric domains. Um, and it's kind of a harder thing in the sense of it's not giving you an embedding into projective space. It's not, it's more of just like a numerical um, coincidence that I think would be interesting to happen. It's definitely the right thing on the level of weight sequences. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's sort of my conjecture. And those things are just much harder to work with because of this total absence of positivity. Right, they're just not related to embeddings really at all. Um, and so, yeah, but you can, but Nunakunkov theory works for such things or there are other, other things we can study are like that. So um, I would love to build a theory for that. That would be really cool. Yeah, I'm saying this because um, Emmanuel Einstein had a student who just defended his thesis and he had some thing that could potentially the generalization to concave toric domains and has to do with the higher singularities. And, uh -huh. I mean, we, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this later. This yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know any of that stuff. Yeah. I think there's some hope. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Ben again. <laughs>